All right, now to baseball. And, of course, the season is coming up very soon, which means your fantasy baseball draft is just around the corner. Now, we want to help you build the best team in the draft. So instead of throwing out a ton of names, we are going to give you the best draft strategy. And if you listened to this broadcast last year with me and Adam Azer of CBS Sports, you'd know that George Springer was in for a big year to grab and also to grab Corey Singer as a shortstop when his price was low. He also warned you to stay away from Carlos Gomez, who ended up getting cut. So this year, we're starting out our all-important conversation talking about the positions you have to have on your roster by round six. And by the middle rounds, let's say the sixth round and beyond, you, you have to have at least one starting pitcher. And I'd like to get my second starting pitcher uh, by the fifth or the sixth round. We're talking in like a 12-team league. So I'd like to have one ace, a top eight, top ten starting pitcher, and then a second-tier guy like a Chris Archer or a Cole Hamels. Not huge on Hamels this year because the walk rate was so high last year. But maybe like a Chris Archer, someone in that 15 to 20 range as my number two starting pitcher. I want two by the sixth round. I want at least one outfielder early in the first three rounds, let's say. Outfield is a very top-heavy position. You've got to get a stud, and then you wait until later in the draft. It's actually a lot like starting pitcher. And by the fifth or sixth round, I might be looking at a guy like Gregory Polanco. I think we're going to talk about him later as my number two outfielder. In those middle rounds, though, you're going to get a third starting pitcher. You might get some infielders in that round. There's going to be great value at third base and second base. So, but the thing is this. It seems like everybody has been chasing power over the past few years, but if there's one attribute that seems to be lacking at the end of the season, and then all of a sudden we're trying to go get is speed. Yeah. Do we need to, to pay a little bit closer attention to trying to grab those speed guys earlier? Speed's brutal. I mean, yeah. last year we saw so many home runs, but steals just keep declining and declining, and we have very few base stealers. At this point, nobody wants to run into an out with how prolific hitters are now. So it's very difficult. And in your early rounds, the best hitters that get steals, the guys like Charlie Blackman, uh, Trey Turner, they go really early. And a lot of them give you power as well, so those are really valuable players to get. If you can't get them... You know, in a categories league, there have been times where I've done some drafts for like a head-to-head -head categories leagues, and I just haven't been able to get D. Gordon or Gene Segura. So I kind of punt steals. I don't want to do it, but yeah, if you don't prioritize it early, what you're going to end up doing is drafting somebody like Eduardo Nunez or Gerard Dyson, guys who really don't give you anything but steals, and those right. they could really hurt you. Billy Hamilton. <laughs> you know, Billy Hamilton came on strong at the end of last year, so I'm right. hopeful. I'm hopeful that he could put it together. But if he's a steal specialist and that's all he does, and you're taking him in the fifth or sixth round, it's a terrible pick. And you're right. So you're, steals are tricky. You want to get a power speed guy early if you can. Well, absolutely. And you know, every year there are also guys who just uh, you know jump up the boards, even though they have a small sample size. Trey Turner, Gary Sanchez, two perfect examples of those guys who are gone by, I don't know, round five or so this year. Is it a mistake, though, to ignore the sophomore slump, not seeing what they yeah. could possibly do this year? It's tricky. You never know what's going to happen with the sophomore slump. You know, last year, Corey Seager, for example, had a great year, and that was probably really his sophomore season. He played a little bit in 2015, so it's not a guarantee. But you expect Trey Turner to be a little bit worse. I think the thing with Turner is by the first week of the season, he's going to have shortstop eligibility. He's going to be eligible at second, short, and outfield. And he steals so many bases, he's going to hit at the top of the order for a great team that even if he regresses in batting average, which he will, he should be fine. I am a little worried about Gary Sanchez. And, yeah, the sophomore slump in general, I think Michael Conforto, Anthony Rizzo, Eric Hosmer, um, uh, Jason Hayward, it goes back. There have been a lot of guys. Sure. So you have to be careful. Uh, when you're going with sophomore guys, yeah, you can. You should expect a little bit of regression. And you mentioned versatility. Uh, you like guys who have third base shortstop versatility, but only if you take advantage of it. If you have Manny Machado and you end up playing him at third base because you ended up getting another shortstop, you know, I mean, Machado's numbers are great for a third yeah. baseman, but they're amazing if you have another third baseman yeah. to put put in behind him as well. But you know, the, as as long as they're we're, we're talking about every year and trying to get guys who are consistent year in and year out. What do you think about those guys that have like career years? Mark Trumbo is a perfect example of someone who had a career year uh, last year. Do you see that as, as a, a guy who's trending up or is it just, again, an anomaly? I wouldn't expect Trumbo to do what he did last year, but his power is obviously legit. He's going to hit in a good ballpark for a good lineup, so he should be a top 20 outfielder, and he's being drafted that way. I think we've gotten to the point in the fantasy community, there's so much research you can do, and we've seen so much, that we know when a guy has a career year, it's, you know, it's not going to happen again. So you look at a guy like Rick Porcello, right? He won the Cy Young last year. He's like the 18th pitcher off the board on draft day. I guess what I'm trying to say is there's already enough baked-in doubt 
that these guys are not going too high in drafts. Like Mark Trumbo, based on what he did last year, should be a third round pick. Let somebody else make that mistake. That's a, yeah, but if you get him in the sixth round in a 12 team league, that's that's fine. You should expect a lot of power and run production from Mark Trumbo. Now, earlier you said you thought the outfield position was really top heavy, but I see a lot of depth deeper in the draft of the outfield. Maybe it's because it's a lot of risk reward guys uh, later in the draft. But if there is, if you do agree that there is uh, a, a ton of depth later in the draft of the outfield, would that inspire you to really try to target infielders earlier? Depends how early. So how I feel about outfield is the same as how I feel about starting pitcher. You do want to get a couple of studs, but you don't want to fill up that position too early when you're building your roster. Because, yeah, the, the two positions that you're going to get the best value at late in the draft, starting pitcher and outfield. You'll get a guy like Jason Hayward. 17th, 18th round. You'll get Byron Buxton who you can take a shot on. You'll get Mitch Haniger. Um, he's, he's even later than that. So Michael Brantley, like 13th, 14th round. You really want to go Michael Brantley once again. You really uh, want to give him another shot. In the 13th or 14th round, I, I will take I don't a even flyer. Know, I, waste another, <laughs> I wasted a roster <laughs> spot on this guy it's last year. It's all about upside. Year. It's all about upside at that point. And just a few years ago, he was one of the best hitters in baseball. But I, I, feel, I feel you there. And there's a lot of options. That's the point. So if you play in a three outfielder league, you certainly don't want to get all three by like the seventh round. Right. Right. I wouldn't take more than two with your first eight picks because uh, maybe your first seven picks because there's such good value at outfield and starting pitcher late. That will help you build your infield earlier. Yeah. Relief pitcher is always a very fluid situation and it is throughout the season. Saves are kind of like steals. It's a category where a lot of owners tend to punt on. Where do you land on saves? Yeah. How, how do you attack your draft with relief pitchers? Don't punt saves. Do not punt <laughs> because saves. Because you're going to be in a world of hurt if you do. Well, if you punt saves, don't forget, you know, if you get a starting pitcher who throws 200 innings and you get league average strikeouts out of that starting pitcher, 200 innings is a lot, by yeah. the way. There aren't that many. You're going to get like 170 strikeouts, okay? You get Kenley Jansen or a role as Chapman, you're going to get 110, 120 strikeouts, something like that. Don't punt saves. I think actually relief pitcher is the one position I am drafting um, more differently this year than I ever have in the past. I think there are about 14 relief pitchers, closers, that are, I don't know if they're all elite, but they all could be elite. Guys like Ken Giles and Edwin Diaz. He could strike out Calvin Herrera, strike out a lot of batters and get a lot of saves. I want at least one of those guys. In the last draft, it was an auction. I got two of those guys, uh, and then and then like Neftali Feliz just for saves later. You don't want to be the guy who's got Neftali Feliz and Brandon Maurer. You know, you want to have at least one of those top 14 because you're going to be at a big disadvantage from the rest of your league at the position if you don't. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of question marks after the top 15 uh, closers out there, so it should be interesting. By the way, every year we ask you if you can identify a player that's maybe going to jump up to the next level. Last year, you identified George Springer, whose average draft position last year was around 75. This year, he's improved to 30. So who's your guy this year? Who's the one that's going to jump from, say, be a, maybe a mid-tier player to a top tier. Gregory Polanco. I love Gregory Polanco this year. I think he was breaking out last year. He was going to be someone that we'd taken like the second round of a draft, but then he played about half the season hurt and his numbers really took a dive. I think uh, best case scenario for Polanco, he's a 25-25 guy uh, with home runs and steals. It's for a respectable batting average. I don't think he's going to excel at that, but he's going to score a lot of runs and could drive in 70, 80 runs. I think Gregory Polanco is going to be a great pick. I like him better than his teammate, Andrew McCutcheon. I was going to say, he's yeah. actually getting drafted a few spots in front of McCutcheon. And they're really they're really close. It depends uh, who you're asking. Look, McCutcheon's not going to steal bases anymore. We talked about how steals are scarce. So get a guy like Polanco in round five or six, and he could really help you in steals and, and a lot more. You can get all of his insights by subscribing to his podcast on CBSSports.com. Adam Azer, thanks so much for coming in again, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's always, always great.